applications in the factory and then applications in the environment uh, and analyzing clouds. Uh, now these are subjects which people all around the world are taking part. Um, these are subjects which are, people are taking part all, all around the world. So let me remind you of siloing. We need to get away from the idea of we are doing research in Morocco and Morocco only and reach out to Harvard, reach out to Stanford, reach out to uh, MIT, reach out to University of Manchester, University of Cambridge, University of Edinburgh and take part in uh, ensemble pro projects with them because you'll get an enormous amount of extra benefit. So, let's move on then. Is anybody else coming back? Or have they all, have they all given up and gone home? No? Okay, the manufacturers. Yeah. The manufacturers, NVIDIA, and we've already started to see uh, NVIDIA products being demonstrated. Intel, uh, which people are also already uh, somewhat familiar with. Uh, and then uh, Huawei. Unfortunately, I don't know anything about Huawei's uh, artificial intelligence development program. I can't show you any demonstrations. I can't show you any kit. Um, they did send a gentleman who talked to people for an hour in Chinese uh, a couple of months ago. Um, but beyond that, they haven't told me anything. So you can go and inquire from Huawei if they have anything equivalent to the kinds of things that I'm showing you today. Okay, any questions? Good. There are other manufacturers. There are lots and lots of them breaking out. Uh, there's tiny hardware like OpenV Camera Board or Spark Edge Fun uh, or XNOR's um, battery free computing hardware that runs on uh, solar energy. Good afternoon. We're talking about the other manufacturers besides Intel and. Um, uh, Intel and NVIDIA, who I'm going to show you today. Unfortunately, I can't tell you anything about Huawei uh, because they signed me up to their development program and never, sent, never talked to me ever since. There are all sorts of different hardware around, all sorts of small companies uh, like MV Camera, Spark Edge Fun, uh, XDoor, which is designed to run on solar, uh, solar power entirely. Uh, then there's custom silicon like the neural compute stick, which I'll show you later, Beaglebone and Google's uh, HTPU, uh, all of which uh, the, main thing, the main problem is getting hold of the boards. Now, NVIDIA has got uh, a Jetson family of products, which range from uh, the high-powered um, uh, data center products uh, for as part of uh, supercomputing in Oak Ridge National Labs, uh, right down to 100 pound uh, or 150, uh, 1500 dirham um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, training workstations that every student can afford one if they want to practice. Uh, artificial intelligence uh, at home uh, and try out with experiments or can be part of uh, a class syllabus if, uh, if the teachers uh, want, to teach, uh, want to teach artificial intelligence. Every student will have uh, one of those. Um, they support a lot of advanced software and uh, a lot of it can be done, a lot of the work can be done on a normal desktop CPU with uh, a GPU board installed. Cost isn't dreadful uh, in UK terms, but uh, finding 
Finding a thousand pounds in a budget to buy a GPU card can sometimes be difficult, but finding 1,500 dirhams to buy a student his own personal uh, AI uh, development station, now that changes the way the world works. Now, uh, the TK1, TX1 are end of life. Uh, they're no longer made, they're no longer supported. Um, and uh, they were nearly five years old. Uh, they're no longer supported, so don't buy them. What they've done is they've used the processor from uh, the TX1 uh, in the Jetson Nano. The TX2, which is the board that I first brought to uh, Morocco with me in 2017, uh, is um, it's uh, about 400 pounds. Uh, it's this size, and the embedded module is this size. Now, if anybody wants to actually see one, um, can we trust people not to steal my development kit, give it back if we pass it around? support. So it is a very full featured, uh, very full featured device. The Xavier, which I couldn't afford, uh, couldn't bring with me, is the latest model. It's nearly six months old now. No, it's nine months old now. Uh, but uh, it is the core of uh, very grown up um, self-driving car. Uh, technology, it can control up to 36 uh, full feature video cameras, um, costs about a uh, thousand pounds, uh, the development kit costs a thousand pounds as well, but uh, it is very, very powerful. Uh, if you can buy one, there are uh, lots and lots of very exciting projects which can be, uh, which can be run uh, on uh, this device, the Xavier. This is a write-up, it's a system on a chip. We'll come back to that when we talk about Intel. Uh, it has got deep learning accelerators. Um, it is a very fast processor but uses a co-processor to go even faster. Uh, it has got vision accelerators. Uh, for making, uh, for making vision work. It is a stereo optical flow um, engine so that it can do depth perception. Uh, and um, this is great for mapping and for uh, scene analysis. And the uh, CPUs are very, very powerful indeed. The uh, TX2 needs a carrier. Uh, to connect uh, the connectors to the uh, processing uh, the processing board. You can see the connectors here on the carrier board. It plugs into the bottom of the TX2 module. And then we come to the Jetson Nano. 
The Jetson Nano is an AI computer for learning and making for 1,500 dirhams. So every student in the university can buy themselves one, uh, plug it into uh, a keyboard and a mouse and a screen, uh, and suddenly you have an AI development system all to yourself. Um, it includes uh, lots of free software, including the Hello AI World uh, application, which we will try out in five minutes with the assistance of my trusty uh, teaching assistant. Has, uh, it has all the features of the ZX2. It supports um, deep streaming, which is the application which allows up to 36 cameras to be controlled in real time. Uh, and uh, you can write your own recognition programs for it in C++. Uh, and then teach yourself uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, takes uh, two days to demo. So uh, that's, um, it then becomes the um, processing, uh, it then becomes the processing agent on board um, the jet bot robot vehicle. So this is a robot, uh, this is the chassis, the 3D printed chassis of a robot vehicle. It's a very poor print because I'm not going to spend 21 hours. I've decided to do a new 12. Uh, but you put wheels on that, you put three wheels on that, you put the processor on top, you put the camera on the front, the Wi Fi on the back, and suddenly you have an autonomous vehicle. And it comes with lots and lots, uh, it comes with lots and lots of free software, uh, and it interfaces to a Jupyter notebook. So you can experiment with it. Now what I would like to do is to use this as the uh, driving element in my Pachemkin Smart City project. And we're saying, what is Pachemkin Smart City? Uh, anybody here learn Russian history? Russian. No? Anybody here heard of uh, Catherine the Great? Empress of Russia. Nobody's heard of Catherine the Great. Oh, dear me. Empress of Russia. Um, she had her husband strangled because he wasn't much use uh, and took over, uh, took over the country and she made Russia great. But she had uh, a minister who used to tell her lies about the state of economic development. So when Catherine would do a tour through uh, the countryside, this minister called the Chemkin would arrange to have uh, the frontages of buildings um, installed in villages before Catherine drove through them. Uh, so that all she saw was the front of a building without any of the rest of the building behind it. When she drove them past, they would tear that down, rearrange the buildings and put it up in the next village along. So Catherine the Great used to see this wonderful economic development happening and it was all a, a total lie. Okay, now the minister's name was Pachemkin, so uh, I've called my smart city after him. I want to laser cut uh, frontages for buildings uh, to make uh, realistic um, models of real towns uh, and then drive uh, self driving cars around them so we can analyze real traffic scenarios in real towns. And uh, you would not believe how uh, useful that might be. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, people are seeing uh, people are seeing the kinds of um, hardware. You're seeing the kinds of uh, do-it-yourself um, self-driving car. Uh, all the software that runs on it is the same software that runs on uh, Ford and Peugeot and Renault's self-driving car model. So, um, uh, anything that you learn here will be immediately usable in um, uh, Ford or Renault or Peugeot or whoever you go to work for. Um, it's a great launch pad for creating entirely new products because it doesn't 
doesn't have to be. Uh, it doesn't have to be. You don't have to use that that shell. Uh, that's just a model to start from. assistant. Teaching assistant. something that get, is given away for free. Okay? That's a freebie. It's an American word, uh, but it is really useful. I got the guys from Marrakech this uh, in December, so they're four months ahead of you in freebies. Okay? Uh, there are lots of freebies around. There are free software, there's free hardware, there's free assistance, there are free tutorials, uh, and, uh, there are free connections. Uh, for people. So, uh, freebie is a really important uh, concept. Now, with the nano comes the freebie um, which uh, introduces us to artificial intelligence. Still running this will take its time getting through, uh, getting through its startup because it takes its time, uh, it takes its time loading. Once, it, once it's loaded, we will uh, walk through. Um, we will walk through the uh, um, the first. Ah, good. Here we are. So how many of you are doing PhDs? Uh-huh. And 
what are you doing for PhDs? You're doing mechanics. Good. Uh, and you're big data. What else? Pardon? Smart education. Smart education. Oh, good. Oh, good. We have the guest up. simple tutorial which walks you through um, setting everything up. So uh, I've already programmed some of them in. So we do classifying images with uh, Jetson. Using the console program on Jetson, uh, we go to, we open a uh, terminal. To, uh, I go to the directory where I have
classify that image as a knowledge. So uh, let me do. Do we need to console? processor then goes through the process of building the inference engine from CUDA, which is uh, a variant of uh, C. And uh, once it is set it up, it has completed that. So um, it has, uh, so we can have a look and see what the output looks like. This was the, uh, the input was the origin, which is shown here. Uh, and the output should be the probability that what it is seeing is an orange. And that basic image recognition. Now, like I said to you this morning, uh, this is all free. You don't have to go and invent all these, uh, uh, you don't have to go and invent all this software. It all comes free. All you have to do is know where to find it, and you can build it into uh, your machines. So let's see what the output from that terminal was. If I do... And lo and behold, we have a picture, the original picture of the orange. The original picture of the orange, and you'll see that the uh, probability that this is an orange is ever so slightly different from the probability uh, that, the, uh, uh, that the example gives you. Uh, and this, what this does is it tells you that uh, I'm not cheating. Um, this is a real result uh, coming from running the software. Okay? And that is, um, that is telling me that that is 97% uh, uh, confident that it's looking at an orange. So if you have to decide whether it's an orange or an apple, you will have, uh, you will be able to make a decision. Because it knows that an apple looks like something else. So we run the apple program. Now this is all hands on. So if anybody wants to come down and drive the software, just to make sure I'm not cheating, no? Okay, well let's do um, let's do the same program, which will run a lot faster this time. Uh, and we do it with um, the Bradley Smith.
this all works straight out of the box. You, uh, um, you just follow the instructions, you plug the power supply into the Jepson Nano, plug it into your screen, uh, and follow the instructions on the box, and all of a sudden you're doing, uh, image, uh, you're doing image classification, uh, which is part of artificial intelligence. And we can do and this should be an apple and it should be fairly confident that it's mm. an apple. Mm. Oh look, it's an apple it's an apple and it says it's ninety seven and ninety nine point nine nine seven confident that it's an apple. There are all sorts of do you remember I said that it builds up uh, recognition of a picture? from uh, little uh, elements of the picture. The little elements of the picture it will detect are this stalk here, the curve here, uh, the top of the apple, the curves on the edge of the apple, the straight bottom. Uh, all those uh, are what adds to the probability that it's looking at an apple. Now if we, uh, we could run this now in real time. I, so what we can do is use the camera that we have. Is anybody, is anybody bored? Or doesn't understand what I'm talking about? No? This is... This is... Uh, the common features of an apple. Like you the, the picture of reason used by the poly. Yeah. Uh, it does it does that and it builds up uh, it builds up the little elements of the picture which contribute to it being an apple. Um, now I can't explain to you today because I haven't got enough time how the whole thing works. But if you want to come to my uh, workshop after Ramadan um, we might talk about uh, how that all works. But you don't really need to be able to make it work yourself because it's all done for you. But uh, anyway, we go on to, we'll skip coding our own uh, image recognition program because I'm not sure we've got the time. But if you want to uh, be able to This is how you prove to yourself that you're not fooling yourself because it gives you three pictures of bears and lets you write your own program to classify uh, whether you're looking at a polar bear, a brown bear or a black bear. Uh, and so within an hour of opening the box with your Jetson Nano, you are actually coding your own artificial intelligence uh, image recognition program and you learn from that. But we're not going to do that today because I'm short of time and Lady Kate will be here uh, in a few minutes. So here's a picture of a polar bear, here's a picture of a brown bear and a black bear. And your image recognition program will allow you to uh, import those images, discover what was common about different kinds of bears, uh, and then use the difference between them to distinguish between a polar bear, a black bear, and a brown bear. And that is something you can give the students to do as homework. Okay? 
is this different? Uh, one of the um, uh, one of the complaints I hear about from students uh, in Morocco is that you're taught the theory, you're allowed to do simulations, but you never get to build anything. Um, so this allows you to build uh, to build uh, real systems. So we move on and look at the next, which is running the live camera recognition demo. But I have um, I have two possible uh, algorithms, uh, two possible uh, recognition engines for um, uh, this device that I have here, which is a very simple camera, which is plugged into the side uh, of my Nano. Uh, one of these doesn't work. The uh, AlexNet. I've tried running it, and it doesn't actually work. So uh, I will try Google Net, which worked for me uh, when I walked through this earlier. So let me go back to this. So, Actually, uh, it is actually um, seeing the class here in, uh, in the room. So uh, this is a real hands-on uh, demonstration. So now, if I show it something real, we will see if we can get it to detect oh, God. <clears throat> Oops.
we expected. Um, in the, uh, with a demo going, it has decided. Uh, it decided it didn't want to play. So what I'll do is I'll restart it and show you the uh, detect net, which detects uh, detects objects in uh, in pictures, and it tells you what to look at. Sorry, we'll have, to, we'll have to restart the demonstration again. But what um, what this um, what this program allows you to do is put an object in front of the camera. Uh, it tells you what it thinks the camera is, uh, what it thinks it's looking at, uh, and then uh, it goes on uh, it goes on to give you um, a list of possible objects that it's looking at. Unfortunately, I may have uh, I may have left out left out the line of configuration, so I will need to go back and start again. Um, ladies, excuse me. Uh, the ladies from the British Embassy, uh, the education advisor from the Madra, will be along very soon. Uh, if you would like to meet her. You never know, you might be able to get her to give you a scholarship. Twelve o'clock. We will uh, we will go on to talk about uh, Intel series of processors uh, and the free software that comes with them too. Hi. Good morning, how's that? Hi. If we can get this to work fairly quickly, I'll make it work later in the afternoon. Uh, and uh, I'll show it to you. Uh, I'll show it to you after the uh, after the talk is over.
I'm sorry, this, uh, this, demo, uh, this demo isn't working uh, quite according to plan, um, but uh, I will uh, rebuild it and show it to people uh, later this evening. Okay? Um, because uh, I don't want to get stuck into um, showing you things <coughs> that don't work because they, uh, they take up vast amounts of time. Hajar.
Okay. Um, when this starts, when we give this time to start up, uh, and then I will show you the demo later. But I'll carry on. Uh, I'll carry on and show you the uh, start showing you the Intel range of processors, and uh, we will <coughs> see. Uh, we'll see if the lady from the British Embassy has arrived yet. I'll just, I'll just have a look outside, and I'll be straight back. And then we will uh, start talking about Intel. Because Intel nearly went broke because of the Chinese, because they were late, uh, they're trying desperately to catch up. Companies which are trying to catch up give away freebies. <laughs> okay? Freebies is important. My demo has just crashed, okay. but it has restarted from the things that have been, looks of things, it has restarted. Okay, good. Uh, these are PhD students, master's students, uh, and uh, Professor Berbia. Uh, Hello. This uh, is Kate uh, from the, uh, she's the Foreign Office's Education Advisor uh, for the Madrid. Yes. So I've just been showing people uh, this tiny artificial intelligence workstation, wow. 100 pounds. Wow. 100 quid. So every student in Morocco can buy one. Uh, it's got a little camera on board. Yeah. Uh, and it runs for Linux and. Um, Minimum attainment. 
So lots of work for me to do here uh, on education, keeping me very busy. Um, and there's also obviously issues with the economy, not just in Morocco, but in many countries um, across the world. The economy is not delivering enough decent jobs with sufficient income for most of the youth population. Um, and particularly women in Morocco find themselves excluded or marginalised from economic activity. Um, the rates I was looking up this morning, only 12% of young Moroccan women in urban areas are economically active. And only 32% of young Moroccan men in urban areas are economically active. Um, yes? Um, for a just make sure everybody is uh, following you. Est-ce que tout le monde est content et comprend ce que Ken dit? Ok. Ok, je, je peux le faire en français si c'est plus. Euh, si c'est meilleur, mais bon. Euh... Ok, fine. Ok, fine. Um, but yeah, and so that sort of brings me to the role of Frank, basically. Um, I think that technology and entrepreneurship could offer a solution to this. The fact that we have these massive levels of youth unemployment in many countries, not just in Morocco. Um, and I don't know if any of you have read the 2019 World Development Report, but it studies how the nature of work is changing as a result of advances in technology today. So obviously technology brings opportunity, uh, creates new jobs, increases productivity, and can help deliver effective public services. Um, and basically, uh, I think it means the rise of the digital platform means that technological effects reach people faster than ever before. And technology is also changing the skills that employers seek. So workers need to be better at complex problem solving, teamwork, and adaptability. Um, so, investing in human capital must be a priority for governments in order for workers to build the skills that are in demand in the labour market. And the UK is looking at how to respond to these changes in the labour market, both domestically and in our work with overseas partners such as Morocco. Technology means that the, global that the labour market will become increasingly global rather than local, so it is in every country's interest that young people everywhere are equipped with the right skills. So some of the things that the UK is doing in Morocco, we have the Chevening Scholarships Programme. I don't know if anybody's heard of that, but I brought along a load of leaflets in case you're interested. So this is our program that funds from Morocco 12 to 13 uh, young people each year, students, to go and study in the UK for a year at UK universities. Um, and we, we interview those people. I was involved in the interviews the other week. And we send the, the best 12 to 13 students to England for a year, fully funded, um, to study usually a master's taught course. So if you want any more information about that, that is here. Um, we are trying to um, ramp up or increase the collaboration between the UK and Morocco in terms of higher education. So uh, I'm working with the Ministry of Education at the moment to see how we can bring about greater research collaboration, greater mobility of students between our two countries, um, and yeah, more PhD collaboration, etc. And I'm looking at, in, I covered Tunisia and Algeria as well, and in Tunisia we've set up a higher education commission between the UK and Tunisia, and we're using that to take forward all sorts of initiatives on collaboration and coordination. So I'm looking at doing something similar here, hopefully, um, and talking to the Ministry of Education about that, hopefully next week. Um, we also have things, Frank was telling me about um, 
catapults, don't we? Yep. Yes, which was new to me actually, Frank, I'm ashamed to say. But um, I was looking them up this morning, and yes, so we've set up these catapults, which are basically not-for-profit, independent technology and innovation centres. But I'm not quite sure what the potential of those for working with Morocco is. They are really, really important because they describe themselves as a bridge. Like I described myself this morning as a bridge between the West and the South and the East for uh, transfer of knowledge and skills and ideas. They are a bridge between the university research and the industry application of the research. Uh, so they meet in the middle to solve real problems. Okay. And they also accelerate uh, the development and commercialization of uh, small ideas uh, okay. into, uh, into much larger companies. Okay, excellent. And they are really, really important. And uh, Professor Asaidi's um, uh, NCS Valley uh, is something similar in Morocco. Right, okay. Yeah, so I have a lot to learn yet about the higher education landscape in Morocco. Given I only arrived last October and I've had to spend a lot of time in Tunisia and Algeria as well. So if anybody wants to educate me on the challenges and the opportunities that you have here, that would be fabulous. Um, I am an education specialist, but I've worked for the government in the UK for many years. Um, before that I was a teacher, that was my first career, a teacher of Spanish, French and German. Um, and before that I was very lucky to go through the best of the UK education system. So I started off in a very rural primary school in the northwest of England, which was very good. Then I went to a grammar school, um, then I went to the University of Cambridge to do my bachelor's degree, and then I did my master's degree at University College London. So I've had lots of my own experience of higher education in the UK, so if anybody has any questions about that, about Chevening, about the British Embassy's role in education in Morocco, um, or anything really, happy to answer any questions. Work, is that enough to talk about? Well, um, <laughs> it's I think it's probably really important that you congratulate Professor Saidi. Yes. I'm sorry, of course. Professor Saidi, many congratulations on your new job. It's also great to see um, a number of people in the room, especially women in this area. We definitely need to get more women into the STEM uh, subjects, and that's a challenge that we face in the UK as well. Anything else you'd like me to mention? Okay. Um, no. Uh, yeah. we okay. For, yes, of course. Um, the next half hour of yeah, of course. presentations and yeah. then um, take a uh, cup of coffee with us. At yeah, and happy to take any questions as well. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. 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 through collaboration with um, a similar, a, a UK university that's doing something similar. Um, so for example, in with the Tunisia Higher Education Commission, we've brought in um, the Quality Assurance Agency from the UK to help look at the standards of the curriculum. Um, and also we're partnering up universities, Tunisian universities with UK universities, where they deliver similar courses to kind of swap curricula and quality assure each other's so that you can also have that mobility of students as well. Yeah, and mutual recognition. Yeah, we're aiming to, to get mutual recognition. So th that's probably the main way. Oh, well, seeing as you hit the nail on the head, this is an example of some possible collaboration. This is a robot from the University of Manchester 
that was launched a month ago, which has found its way here, and we're exploring whether we can set up a joint project with the University of Manchester on this leading edge, uh, on this leading edge um, robotic subject. Brilliant. And, uh, okay, peace out. Est-ce qu'il y a des gens? And that's what I would hope to do through that Higher Education Commission, if I can get one set up. So you may get counted, though, in terms of numbers, um, in the numbers of your, um, your native country. So that might be how it would work, but I think you could probably get interviewed here. Right, we were talking about, did you like that lady?
There should be plenty. There should be plenty for everybody to have one. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to, if you want to spend six months uh, with an industrial company uh, as part of a university project, uh, that can be arranged too. students, they give away things. So, what was the word I taught you earlier this morning? Freebie. Freebie. Well done, that man. Take an apple. Um, okay, they give away freebies. They give away free software. They give away free development kits. Uh, they give away free samples. Uh, and they give away lots and lots of advice. Now, if you are uh, intending to repair, uh, to respond to the secretary uh, to the minister of education's appeal uh, off for artificial intelligence programs uh, if you contact me i will put you in contact with the guys in intel who will give you all the support you want to make your project happen ah oh this is what happens when you go to uh, industry exhibitions in Manchester uh, and listen to what the guys are telling you 
Um, and uh, I, my job is to pass on the information from there to here. So if you want the Intel company supporting your project, which you are trying to impress the Minister for Education with, send me an email. Anyway, Intel made some very powerful uh, CPUs for um, data centers and PCs and things like that. Um, but they didn't do GPUs. They have something that is coming along in 2020. They're just starting to announce. Not yet. 2020. This is why you need to have the contact at Intel because you get first user, you get pre-release, uh, you get pre-release kits, uh, and you're there in the market, in the world, and you are pitching for the whole African market. Okay? And you are looking for a thousand million people, so that impresses the venture capitalists. Okay? So this is uh, part of their catch-up. They, uh, they recruited senior management uh, and like the King did here a couple of years ago when he threw out the government, Intel and their investors threw out uh, the senior management of Intel and replaced them with people who could get them back in the market. So that's GPUs. Now, They don't just do chips. They also do a thing called the Movidius uh, Compute Stick, which is a GPU on something which plugs into the side of uh, your PC. So it gives you a GPU coprocessor. This is, uh, this is a video of somebody using simple camera, plug it into a Jetson Nano, for analyzing the water quality and identifying all the bacteria and uh, um, uh, animals uh, in the water supply. Now this has obvious health implications. I have a student who works on this. Good. Good. Well, this is, uh, this is cheap, computing, um, cheap computing capacity. And the great beauty of the Intel processor family is if you can get it to work on one processor, you can transport it across to the other processors. Which means you can develop on something cheap and cheerful, like this Movidius uh, compute stick. Here we are using it for, that's what it looks like. Plugs into uh, the USB slot. And here we are using it to detect the difference between uh, a mole, which is a natural growth on the skin, uh, and skin cancer. If you catch skin cancer early, it doesn't kill you. But you have to be able to tell the difference between a mole and the cancer. And this light stick, which is plugged into the Movidius, now if I stop that there, uh, thing, This will start again in a moment. But uh, if you uh, uh, have a look at the bottom of the screen, I've pointed out to you uh, when it comes up, uh, there's a little percentage about, uh, it thinks it's 90% probable that this is a mole that it's looking at, little brown, uh, little brown mark on the skin, uh, and 10% probable that it's skin cancer. Yeah. So that gives you uh, that gives you an estimate of whether to worry or not. I'll point out I'll point out the point on the uh, on the pictures for you. Now this is plug and play. The software comes free. You plug it in, uh, and away you go. Now this can be part of your bigger project uh, to propose to the Minister for Education, and it's also something that you can teach in class. Okay, this is uh, identifying creepy crawlies in the water. This one.
This is the device. Plugs into a camera. That's taking the measurements. Um, you can see down here the percentage. It's 75%, uh, 86% uh, a mole, uh, and therefore not dangerous. And 9% uh, <coughs> probable that it is uh, skin cancer. Now that uh, is really important because that changes the way health services can work in Morocco. Because you can make use, uh, you can make use of all this technology very cheaply in doctors' offices, and uh, you can use it for analysing um, other uh, medical samples. As I showed you earlier this morning, the um, As I told you this morning, as I showed you this morning, the experiment that they carried out in Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, where they looked at the error rate in cancer uh, cancer detection of uh, a specialist as being about 95 percent, machine as being about 94 percent accuracy, combined the specialist and the machine together, and the accuracy goes up to 99.5 percent. Now that uh, is something I would really love to um, tell people in the Cancer Research Institutes in Morocco far more about, but we started off by talking about, what was the word I used? Do you remember? Do you remember the word I used about siloing? Silos, the doctors don't talk to the informaticians and so on. So you need to get the cancer specialist to talk to the IT specialist, to the machine intelligence specialists, and all of a sudden you have uh, really important, um, uh, really important things that happen. Now, the next thing I want to tell you about is really leading edge. Have you got uh, anybody working on uh, FP, uh, FPGA yet? Yeah. Uh, what are they doing? Okay. 
You know that cat? She's on another cat. Uh, nah, she's on the phone. <laughs> okay, uh, that's FPGAs. Uh, if you don't know anything about FPGAs yet, um, uh, here's the place to start learning. Don't be put off by the name. This is a very cheap book, uh, and it's got most of the information that you need in there. Uh, if you need to learn more, it tells you where to go and look for more. Uh, but if you want to start, this book is about six pounds, uh, and it's available in the bookshops, uh, and you can go and read it in a day or two, but it gets you started. Once you know the magic words, then you can start building a project. Now, I want to see an FPGA development capability in NCS uh, very soon, and to see some projects developed uh, which make use of the reprogrammability. Okay, is this something new that people hadn't heard about until today? Yeah? De nouveau? Sont des choses nouveau? Right? Okay. Now here are some magic words that nobody has ever heard of before today, I'm sure. Uh, and this is because Intel, remember the comeback kid? Uh, it's the terrified investors who are looking at going broke, uh, saying to the engineers, what good ideas have you got? And so they said, well, we can't build any, uh, we can't build chips in two dimensions anymore. Let's build them in three dimensions. Okay? So you stack chip on top of chip on top of the chip, uh, or parts of chips. Uh, so I'll show you, um, I'll show you the video. But this is, uh, these are the magic words uh, that you can drop into conversation. So if you're talking to somebody, you say, "Well, I know about the email. I know about uh, the interposers that Intel call overalls." Okay. And that's how you, uh, uh, that's, uh, these are the keywords that you start doing Google searches on. And if this works, we get a two minute uh, Intel video to watch. Yeah. Why won't it reach the internet? IT guy? This is Lakefield, the first CPU architecture to take advantage of Intel's latest processor design and packaging innovations. These recently announced breakthroughs allow us to integrate different CPU core architectures onto a single product to create what we call a hybrid CPU. In this example, the processor has five cores, combining one 10 nanometer high performance Sunny Cove core with four 10 nanometer based smaller cores. The result is a product that is optimized for power efficiency, immersive graphics, I.O. and memory, all in this tiny SOC, which is approximately 12 millimeters square. We then pair this hybrid CPU architecture approach with an innovative 3D packaging technique we call Foveros, that allows us to actually stack various pieces of IP together in three dimensions, rather than two. The result is a tiny SOC that is now packed with all the no-compromise PC technology that people have come to expect from Intel, driving longer battery life, world-class performance, and blazing fast connectivity.
All of which means we can now do much smaller chips and much smaller boards while maintaining great performance in highly power efficient designs. Which is why we expect this technology to unleash a wave of platform innovation industry wide, creating entirely new classes of highly mobile devices and helping to advance PC innovation by bringing new experiences to life. Now you'll remember when I said to you this morning, when we started at some point today, uh, you will turn around and say to yourself, good grief, can we really do that? And I'm saying, yes, oh yes, yeah. yes we can. Um, all you need to know is what Intel is offering uh, and say, I am Professor Bergia of the uh, Embedded Department of uh, NCS. Uh, and some of my students want to work on really low power, uh, low power customized processors. Um, and you will be designing processors and systems on chips and systems for uh, embedded products that you will sell all around Africa. Uh, and all you need to know is the magic word. And the magic word is please always talk to the Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, um, was that something new? Had anybody heard of uh, Phobros before? No? Good, I have uh, brought you something new. Good, I've earned my lunch. <laughs> okay, so, um, that's the next slide. So, are there questions? Okay, so, piece of I want to know the difference between the CPU and the GPU. The CPU has a complex uh, processing core, a small amount of RAM, uh, and lots of I.O. Uh, and the complex, uh, the complex core uh, is big, and it has lots of interconnectivity in it. Uh, with lots of elements, uh, and it's very difficult to change. The GPU uses lots <coughs> and lots, that is 30,000 uh, small uh, cores which do very simple arithmetic, um, very simple uh, arithmetic operations. So uh, it, will be, uh, it will be optimized for adding two numbers together. But because you've got 30,000 of them, if you need to add two sets of 30,000 numbers together, you just fire the whole 30,000 pairs of numbers out to the GPU, and they do it in parallel, and it all uh, give you back the uh, give you back the result. Uh, and that works blindingly fast um, because all image analysis is about mathematical trans uh, transformations as is uh, graphics processing for um, uh, graphics processing for uh, games and things like that. Uh, these processors are targeted at uh, mathematical, simple mathematical operations which need to work very fast. That's the big difference. General purpose, a general purpose computer, a small amount of memory, um, uh, very complex process, small number of very complex processors, versus a uh, large number of very simple processors and a large amount of memory. That's the difference between CPU and GPU. Uh, and concerning CPU used in computers, can we replace them with the GPU? The ones that are coming through have got uh, inbuilt uh, in GPUs as part of the CPU, so CPU-GPU uh, combination. Uh, and you will find that you already have GPUs in uh, your CP, uh, in your PC, because that's what makes the games go. They drive the, they drive the screens for games, and you can put a, a card in alongside the CPU, which turns it into a very powerful general purpose processor. <coughs> Thank you. 
Okay, uh, I expect somebody will lock up the room. Okay, good. Not from the room, is it going to be up? Sit, sit. 